I'd love to tell you about May Foley. And this is the story I found because one of my girlfriends in Florida said, you know, I know that the first book you did was really nice and all that, but you need to write about my husband's grandmother. And I said, what did she do? Well, she was in World War, not in World War I, but at that time, she joined the New York Police Department. And I said, really? And then she gave me the pictures and some of the stories, and I was hooked. So I continued to follow May's story and do research on it. And I'll tell you, she grew up in the Lower East Side in New York. She was born in 1886. Her parents were immigrants, and they lived in the gas house district. You can see these big gas tanks. And that was what was used for street lights. It was a dangerous area to live. The gas tanks sometimes leaked, sometimes they exploded. Um, you could smell them. <clears throat> this is a slum, a slum part of New York City. And just a mile away, a little north of there, is some of the more wealthy parts of New York. This is the Gilded Age, the time of the Rockefellers and the Astors building these huge homes on Broadway. And they grew up, went to Catholic school, and by the time she's in her last year of high school, she meets this nice man. They fall in love. They get married a year later. Her mother does not exactly approve of this because he is 14 years older than her and divorced. So she liked to say that while she got married at the Catholic Church, it wasn't in it. After they get married, they find an apartment in Brooklyn, and two of his children live with them. So it's, it's time to get a little more money and make some money. So she takes, by then they have two daughters, Gracie and another one who I, whose name I can't remember at the moment because she's not in the picture much. And she takes Gracie to Broadway and gets Grace a, a part in a Broadway play. So that's a great way to bring in a little more money. Take your kid out and put them on Broadway. But she starts to make friends in Broadway. And May is very social. She likes to sing Irish songs at events. Um, she likes to play bunko. I had to learn how to play bunko to be able to understand some of what she did in this book. And have card parties. So around 1917, the NYPD starts to recruit for a police reserve. Now there were women in the police department since around 1891, but they were called matrons. And their job was to clean the jail cells. So they didn't do much more, but they also had to take care of wayward children, some of the women who were imprisoned, or even women criminals. So by the time we get to 1900, there's about 69 of them. But still, there aren't any who do police work. So starting this police reserve means maybe we will have more women actually doing some type of police work. They don't get paid. This is a volunteer activity. May helps recruit 2,000 women to do this from across the boroughs in New York City. And you can see them in the upper left doing what we call in the Army PT. It's a little hard to do physical training wearing a, a floor length skirt, the high button shoes. And one of the people who would later become May's boss, when she started in 1911, she came to work the first day quite decked out and carrying a parasol. So that didn't work either. So some of these standards started to change. Now this little group in the lower right, <clears throat> it's the Broadway squad with the, with the volunteer group. They got to patrol the streets of Broadway and make it safe for theater goers. They didn't have any authority, any arrest authority at all, but they had uniforms. The people who actually worked for the police department didn't have uniforms. I just think that's kind of odd, a little backwards maybe. But one of the other things that May got to do was they had to patrol the areas where the Navy trained during World War I and up in Manhattan where they had the naval training ship. Why? Because there were runaway girls from all over the United States going there looking for sailors. Or as May would say, we have to protect the girls from the boys and the boys from the girls. And so they would find them on the streets, sometimes with really bad tattoos of ships, and then help them go home again. <clears throat> but she enjoyed this. She enjoyed the camaraderie. She enjoyed feeling like she was making a difference in the community because after high school, she had worked somewhat for the city in settlement houses, helping immigrants find their way in the city. So by this time, she thinks, you know, I think I want to join. 
I think I want to join the police department. And by 1918, the police commissioner authorized the hiring of actual police women. And they hired eight. And then he said, the next year, we're going to hire nine. Now, by 1920, what happens? Women get the vote. They do away with the rank of matron and create police women as a permanent part of the force. And May says, I'm ready. Well, she might be, but her husband, John Foley, is not. You want to join the police department? You know, that's dangerous. I'm not sure what I think of that. Well, she says the kids are a little older now, and the NYPD takes care of its own. So let's talk about a package deal. I get to join the police department, and you get a job as a private detective. So now he's interested. Because what was he doing then? Repairing washing machines. Well, then it sounds good. So he became a detective in a department store in Brooklyn, and then later transferred to the Pinkerton Detective Agency. And May says that later in his career, he was responsible for all of the racetracks in New York. What a great job, right? You get to go to the track every day. He liked that. So she joins in 1923. And by then, we actually have real training. And one of the specification was that all of the women who joined the NYPD to be police women had to learn how to use a weapon, which was a 38 special revolver, and they had to learn jujitsu so that they could take down bad guys. And I have seen pictures of the jujitsu training, and it, they brought the mayor in at the time to watch this, and he was, whoa, that, that's really interesting. I think I'd better watch myself. <laughs> <clears throat> Her first job is with the Masher Squad. This was created around 1922 because there were so many men who annoyed women on the subways and on the streets, <laughs> either flirting or touching. They were called cake eaters, the good-looking young men who liked to go out and do minor assaults, if you will. So the, the first group was called the Masher Squad. There were 10 of them. I think May is just out of this picture. But she was part of that first group, and they competed to see who could make the most arrests. So <clears throat> May told her grandson the story of one of her first arrests. This was near Broadway, where there was one night a man in a phone booth waiting for her to get close. And then he said, hey, lady, look what I got for you. And she said, I got something for you, too, and slammed the door on him. And that was it. Now, they didn't have arrest authority, but they had with them five detectives. Somehow, all of those detectives were named Will William. So they were called the Willie Boys. So it was, you'd capture someone, use the jujitsu move on them, and call a Willie Boy. That's what they did. She was assigned to the 19th Precinct, which is in Upper Midtown Manhattan, a very well-to-do area. And then she also worked in Prohibition. So she stayed in, with the 19th Precinct from 1923 up until 1928. And in 1928, her husband died of a heart attack. So now she has two teenage girls that she's going to have to raise herself. So she moves. She asks for a transfer, and she moves to another precinct. <clears throat> but first, she has a run-in with a woman prisoner. And this is Charlotte Flock who comes in and may has to do those as additional duties as a sign, which means police women have to frisk the prisoners. So she goes in to frisk this woman who's been arrested, and the woman pulls a gun on her, which she had hidden in her girdle, along with a, ni a nice big bag of additional ammunition in case you need that. So she's charged with assault, but I wanted to show you this, the newspaper coverage. A lot of the research I did was in the newspapers of the time. Now, in about the mid-1800s, there were 373 newspapers in the United States. Fifty-five of them were in New York City. So by the time May is in the police department, there are hundreds of newspapers, and they are morning, noon, and night. Some of them are not <clears throat> exactly factual. So here on the left is the correct story. The gun toter and policewoman who subdued her. And then what is this on the right? It's a meme. This is what another newspaper did. They created this picture. You know, put, the, put an arm in there and made May look like I got her now. 
and published it like it was real. I had a great time with that. <clears throat> but I want to tell you a little bit about some of her contemporaries, too. The story says that this woman fought like a wildcat and called May the Amazon of New York. So what she did was go to her boss and say, I never want to be in the newspapers again. Because this is the time Tarzan movies were just starting. They were silent ones at first. But for years, she would walk into a station house and people would go, there's the Amazon of New York. And then they would do the Tarzan yell. So she wanted to make sure she didn't get any more publicity. So it just made it harder to find things out about her. But here's some of the people that she knew at the time. And these people had the greatest nicknames you can imagine. Uh, Mary Sullivan, <clears throat> in the lower left, she became the head of the bureau and was May's boss up until the time May retired in 1945. Now, Mary retired just a few months later, and she wrote an autobiography. Does anybody remember this TV series from, I think, the 70s that had in it Angie Dickinson mm -hmm. called Police Woman? It's mm -hmm. based on her, all of her time undercover. And then the one that she first learned about, Isabella Goodwin, is there in the middle. Isabella was a matron who went undercover to get evidence on a murderer. So she pretended to be a maid in a flop house and made friends with a mobster's girlfriend to gather evidence. So those two were the first two detectives in New York, promoted as detectives, straight from matron to detective. Later on here in the upper left is Mary Shanley, Deadshot Mary. I have a gun and I know how to use it. And she liked to use it. So she was on the pickpocket squad. And if thieves ran from her, she'd shoot in the air until they stopped. She got in trouble for that at one time when she shot up a bar. You know, she was just showing off a little bit. But, <clears throat> but she got her job back. And here is one of May's friends in the lower right. Um, who was a Broadway star, Edna Pitkin. And Edna was a little bit, well, like all of them, they were a little bit wild, I think. And Edna said, oh, look, guess what I did today? They were going to test out a new bulletproof vest. It was metal with springs in it. And they, they needed a volunteer, so I volunteered, and I let him shoot me. And you know, look at that. It didn't even tickle. It was good. So those are some of her contemporaries. So no wonder her husband worried about her. <laughs> So by the, by the time we get up to the 1930s, she is still, still with the 108th Precinct in Queens. She now has a little house there, a cottage. The kids are getting older. And these are in every precinct house. These, they look like, like a college sorority thing. And you can see she's right there in the middle, still not in uniform, because they don't have uniforms yet. Now, this picture was given to the New York Police Department Museum by her grandson. And then they lost it. So I'm glad at least there's this. They didn't the get uniforms. Picture. Huh? The individual picture. No, that. that yeah. So they didn't get uniforms until 1935. There's a lineup of them on the left. None of them look happy at this, uh, this prospect. Because this is a, a jacket, a cap, a skirt, and then the shield. Now, May's shield number was 31 from when she came in. She'd lost it somewhere along the way. So when she retired, the Benevolent, Benevolent Policewoman Society gave her a new one that said 76. The numbers now of the shields in the NYPD are in the 35,000s. <clears throat> So here she is in her new uniform, looking none too happy about it. But it also came with a purse. And that purse had a special compartment in it for your weapon and your lipstick. <laughs> or as the mayor said, now ladies, just use both of them very judiciously. She got a big kick out of that. But during the 1930s in New York, it's the rise of the mobs. And the rise of violence and crimes, too. And they had a variety of jobs there. She was bait for a serial killer, asked to go out at night and sit in a parked car with a male detective and pretend they were out there canoodling. 
and hopefully luring the serial killer to come over. Well, he did not, but an armed robber did, so they got him. <laughs> and then she was transferred on a special assignment to the district attorney's office and asked to be the person to oversee all of the women witnesses for the mob trial of Lucky Luciano. Luciano ran numbers game, but he also had houses of ill repute. <clears throat> and one of the attorneys decided, hey, they all have the same bail bondsmen, so let's arrest all two or three hundred of them, and then none of them can get out because they're all trying to call the same guy. So then a number of them turned. There was 45 some witnesses. They too had amazing nicknames. Uh, the lead, the lead um, lady of the evening, who is the woman in the front is a uh, policewoman. Behind her is Cokie Flo. What a great name, Cokie Flo. <clears throat> so she went through two trials, which lasted two and a half, three years. And after that, she was glad to leave the district attorney's office, but she got a new assignment undercover, infiltrating the Nazi movement in New York, which was huge in the 1930s. There were summer camps for kids. There were rallies. There were some members of the NYPD who had joined. This picture on the upper right is the biggest rally they had. This is in February of 1939 in Madison Square Garden. It was meant to be George Washington's birthday salute, but it was really Heil Hitler. And she was there undercover for this. She was not permitted to go into the station. She had to do all of her reports remotely. And she stayed with this until the leader of the Nazi movement was convicted. She was really glad when that was over. But she stayed with the department throughout the war, continuing to go undercover doing work with the FBI on issues of infiltration, sabotage, and there was quite a bit of that in New York. There was a ship that was bombed in the New York Harbor, or was it really an accident? Was it really just something went wrong and there was a fire? Well, this happened just after Pearl Harbor, and then the ship lay on its side in the harbor for the next six months, so people were frightened. And every agency from the federal and state government you can imagine investigated that, and she was part of that investigation. So by the time we get to 1945, she's seeing things change again. There is the famous class of 1940. Every <clears throat> police officer in that class, except for six, rose to the heights of the department, including Gertrude Schimmel and one of her compatriots who in the 1970s sued the department to be permitted to be promoted to sergeant. Women still wore the skirts up until the 1970s, <clears throat> when there were protests by the males about not wanting them to ride in patrol cars. It wasn't really the men, though, it was their wives. So they changed the, the lexicon at the time, too. They were no longer police women and patrolmen, they were police officers. By that time, in, in retirement, May was advocating for better benefits, not just for women, not just for police women, but for policemen and for fire. She was well known in every bit of city government. She would go to all the meetings. But along the way, she had discovered what a great thing to do for stress relief. Because it's a stressful job when you don't know what every day is going to be like. I like her solution. She took a cruise every year. <laughs> um, big cruises. You know, these were ocean liners at the time through the 1920s and 30s. Her husband didn't want to go. Sometimes she went with her friends from Broadway. But that had to stop during the war when all of the ships were appropriated, and it certainly wasn't safe. She did one little cruise to Central America, but it wasn't the same. So she continued to do cruises after the war. But she also found time to go to Florida. So she retired on December 31st, 1945. One minute after midnight, she gets in her car and drives to Florida. She had a brand new car. It had turn signals. They made absolutely no sense to her. Why would I have to put my arm, put, go, I go like this when I want to turn right. Why do I have to push this lever? And I don't want to do that to go left. That makes no sense. So she drives out into the blizzard with the window down so she can turn and drives to Florida. And she did that every year, spent about six months in Florida for the next 20 years. But what she did and what her compatriots did 
had a huge impact on how the department grew and how it changed. It's very hard to find information about that time period because you have the official reports to the city and then you have the newspapers. But the NYPD destroyed all of their files before 1930. They dumped them in the East River. Well, we're moving to a new building and they were heavy, so we didn't take them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure there was a lot more in there than we want to know. <clears throat> so May had two grandsons, Bobby and Johnny. So Johnny is the one who gave me most of the information and told me the stories about his grandma, who would tell him all of the wild things she did. And Bobby wanted to be a police officer, but his vision wasn't good enough. So he joined the Army. Okay. Johnny did join the police department in Greenwood Lake, New York. And at, he was retired medically after having been shot in the line of duty. He's fine now. I, got, I talk to him all the time. And Bobby still lives in New York, but his children, now May's great-grandson and great-granddaughter, are both serving officers with the NYPD. So I, there's, there's definitely legacy in this and, and family throughout what you find with the New York Police Department. So there is an initiative now called 30 by 30. And this is started by Columbia University to increase the number of women in policing by 2030 to 30%. The NYPD right now is at about 20%. And the average across the country is between 12 and 18%, which is about where the U.S. Army is, around 18%. Meanwhile, in business, in the private sector, 50% of the people who work in private business are women, 50% of the population. 36% are CEOs. So we have a ways to go in some areas. And the, <clears throat> the studies done by Columbia University show that women, in, women police are less prone to violence and less prone to excessive violence seek better outcomes for the families or the victims, and that they also have a greater rate of success. So I think that's some of May's legacy as well. But I'm happy to answer your questions, and I hope I didn't talk too fast. I was so worried it would rain, and it's not. <laughs> Can I just start off, General, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And I, I can see you're highly skilled. And so are your presentation skills. It was so perfect. In my introduction, um, I didn't read the last part because I wanted to get going here. But I'd love to know a little bit more about you, if we could segue, just for um, General Eder is the former commanding general of the US Army Reserve Group and Special <coughs> Support Command former Deputy Chief of the Armor Reserve and former Deputy Chief of Public Affairs for the U.S. Army. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you I do. I know I could have gone on and on in my introduction. You could have. But people were so patient and I just. I was just going to turn the lights out. <laughs> so just a little bit about yourself and then we'll. Well, I think I identify with some of these people. Sure. Uh, and, and there's a quote on the wall upstairs. I, I think it's by Truman who said, the only <clears throat> truth we don't know is the history we haven't found yet. So I think there is so much that we don't know about what they did. We talk about trailblazers. Well, trails get overrun and people forget. And then we start over again. So you talk to me about the WASP. Well, it was in the 1970s that the Air Force proudly announced we're going to let women fly jets for the first time. And those who were veterans who had been serving with the Women Air Service pilots in World War II rose up and said, oh no, we were first. You forgot about us. And that, they were still not even veterans. They were not even told they could be veterans yet. So I think that there's a lot to learn about this. And it does relate to today. And in the great scheme of things, this isn't you know, history back there with the pyramids. This is yesterday. And in the effects for what it has for all of us now. If you think about what they felt after getting the vote, seeing things change after the war, it's called, the times are a-changing. Let's, let's, make, let's make a difference now. So I came into the Army at a time when things were changing, too. This is just after, after Vietnam. It was not a great time to be in the Army. I did that for five years. I left, and I came back because I missed the people. I missed my friends. 
and you do the jobs you're given. You don't complain about the jobs you're given. May, May did the jobs she was given. She didn't complain about them. She didn't ask for special treatment. And she didn't want to be put on a pedestal or be made much of, <clears throat> which endeared her to her, her fellows. Now, certainly in that picture I showed you of women getting uniforms, they interviewed male policemen who said, well, why put a uniform on them? They don't do anything anyway. So, so you get the attitudes based on what they see and not what we understand about the restrictions or, well, sure, go ahead, chase somebody down the street in heels and a skirt. Backwards. Backwards. Well, or if you have the gun that Mary Shanley had, you could probably stop that. But, but there's a little bit of that, too. So. You do the jobs you're given, you, you get to learn and experience and enjoy the time you have because it's always too short. Anybody else? Hurry before she asks me something else. <laughs> I could go on about, um, you said you came here from the Army War College and you're going back to the Army War College. So yeah, we could probably have General Eater talk about many more life experiences that are still ongoing. Well, I think it's important to have that in Pennsylvania. And I am happy it has stayed here because there have been attempts to move it. But it brings in senior level students, not just from the military, but from other federal agencies, the th some of the three letter agencies. And they learn how to be very senior level diplomats, commanders, representatives of this country all over the world. And there are at least several hundred international students. They come to Hershey, they come to baseball games. Mm -hmm. They have to have a class beforehand to explain to them what this is. Mm -hmm. But they, they take them out and show them America and American life. And that is an, an incredible investment. You know, we, we study history in blocks. World War II, the post-war period, the Great Depression, and it's not. It's just all one continuous flow. Mm -hmm. And you can't study one block without understanding everything that came before it. Because when you do, you see the connections. Mm -hmm. So. The earlier book I wrote, I kept finding people who knew of each other or knew about each other. In this book, May talks about how what they did in the reserve was very much like what the Women's Army Corps did in World War II. And she knew a number of them. So all things are connected in that way, and I continue to learn that. Service, patriotism, women, and relatively recent, as you said. You know, it's relatively recent in the whole scheme, timeline, that women are in the workplace, in the military, flying jets, the wasps, and I think it takes time to evolve, reinvent, um, and it takes time for women to speak to, you know, just stand up for themselves. It takes volume. It takes volume. Good. Because <coughs> where she was, she, she's the only one in the, right. in the precinct listening to Tarzan yells. So, and some of it is, okay, how are you gonna take that? You gonna have a good sense of humor or not? So, some of the research, what I did was go to Ancestry and build her family tree as a way to find more connections. And <clears throat> there's a whole lot of people named Foley in New York City. And there's a whole lot of McGuire's and there's a whole lot of Greer's, McGregor's and, so, and for the, many of the Irish, it's a family business. And, Two of the people she worked with were the ones who started the, um, the bagpipes and drum corps, and they played at her funeral. They had police officers lined up for six city blocks when she passed away, and they had the funeral procession on the way to the cemetery. Anyone else? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, wait, you got one more. You got one more. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. I was just going to say, um, as a retired major general from the Army, must the Army approve what you write once you're retired? That was my job in Army Public Affairs, to approve what other retired generals wrote so I can improve myself. <laughs> okay. That's <laughs> <Well done. laughs> the answer. Thank you. In other words, nobody's questioned that. Nobody questions that. Okay, I want to thank you all for coming.